Okay. If you don't like hot dogs, then you gotta eat expensive. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, uh, our Wednesday Night Live program kicks off on September 4th. We have a kickoff party that that evening, but we are in need of volunteers. It takes people to run it. Okay. And we have people in key places, but we need crowd control at this point. Okay. And so we need people to kind of be here to get to know the students, to hang out with them, to participate in things, to help out in the, in the, in the lesson times, in the craft times, different things like that. Uh, we need help. And so we're going to have a meeting today after church in the library slash sisterhood room, just right down here on, next to the restrooms. So if you want to help participate in that, to volunteer, 
It greatly helped us out. That would be fantastic. It is preschool through sixth grade is, are the age groups that you work with. And we usually split the preschool through first grade into one group and then the uh, second through sixth grade into another group when they go to their lessons and their craft times, okay? But there's different events that we do. We do bowling, we go Christmas caroling, and we need people, we need bodies to kind of help us with the kids. So we sure would appreciate the volunteer help for that. As always, the Montana Women's Fellowship is still uh, gearing up. There's the QR code. I remember today what that's called. Uh -huh. faces. So, <laughs> not your faces, technology's faces. Okay, uh, and then there are uh, sign-up lists down on the bulletin board. There's a sign-up list down on the bulletin board for the gift baskets, right? The gift baskets you're going to give away. And there's some different things on there that you might not know what they are. I was having some discussion with some ladies this morning, and I'm like, we don't know what this stuff is. And I was trying to explain to them what it is. And so if you don't know what something is, please ask. Um, nobody's going to be like, oh, you don't know what that is? Nobody's going to be weird about it, okay? Uh, just, just, just ask. If you want to sign up to volunteer to bring something, we sure would appreciate that too, okay? Is there any other questions or thoughts or uh, announcements that I might have missed? Yeah, Tara. We are just kind of curious if you could do 10 hot dogs. Oh, I can do like 15. My, my starting is like 10. Uh, like, I buy like 20 hot dogs for my, me and my family, and I eat like 12 of them right away. Come and find out. It's not something Yeah, come and find out. You can see the hot dog gorge fest if you want. And they're not like, they're not cheap Oscar Myers either. They're like pioneer meat hot dogs, okay? They're really good. They're more like sausages than they are uh, like grody, mashed up pork, okay? They're all beef. They're good. I love them. So, any other questions? Okay, I, wouldn't want yeah. to say I was going to tell the junior and senior <laughs> hires and their parents that if you have friends that might have not come to church or maybe they go to a different church, you guys can invite them out to our place because it's going to be a fun evening where we hang out. So don't don't be thinking, oh well, just my friends that already have been to this church or go to this church. Absolutely. Or so if you have a crew. Then reach out to them and say, hey, we're going to do something fun to be at the church side. Right. Youth group and church both are places of welcome. So invite whoever you want, okay? We would love it. Anything else? All right. Let me open with us with a word of prayer, and I'll hand it back over. Lord, we just come to you to say thank you for this day. We thank you for family. Uh, another week to come together and to worship together as family and to worship you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, we are so thankful for these friends and, 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 and what we call family, Lord. And, and we just we know that you are, are guiding our lives and guiding uh, a guiding presence in our community. And I pray that you continue to help us to lead in our community and to be those people that, that live for you in everything that we do. Father, we are so thankful for all that you do in our lives. And we are thankful for um, the opportunities you give to witness to others. Father, as we begin gearing up for our fall ministries with our youth groups and our Wednesday Night Live, Lord, and, and different things going on, I pray that you would be in those and help us to, to reach as many people as possible, Lord, that we might become uh, all things to all people, that we might save some, Lord. Just give us the opportunity. Uh, lead them our way. Uh, Lord, we just are so thankful for everything that you do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Can you please stand again? In case you're snoozing, this one's a little fast. <laughs>
church as we come to our prayer and praise time this morning what do we have this week for our praise Well, so far, so we just pray that things will be all right. 
Kate, Derek, and, and Jenny are traveling from uh, Anchorage uh, yeah. Yeah. here, and they still got a few days left and just safety and travel. Yeah. And they can find places to stay. Yeah. And Rick and Chris are looking forward to seeing them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what else do we have for our parties? Jen in the back. Uh, I wanted to give a quick update. Um, I'm still going strong on my treatments, but uh, we have noticed since I started, I have been sleeping. For the first time in seven years, I've been sleeping. So uh, I usually average about four hours and I've been averaging at least seven. So it's a big difference. So hopefully that translates to my nervous system chilling out and we can get on to dealing with the pain. Okay, so Jen's just saying since she's been on the treatments, she's getting a lot better rest at night. And just to continue to keep her in her prayers as she continues just to get better. Lois. I got the test results early this last week. The, the spot is still there. It's not gotten any bigger. It hasn't gotten any smaller. It hasn't moved. And instead of checking me every two years for this thing, they are checking me every year. They have said now it's gone into emphysema, but you can't prove it by me. So, okay. And the kids down south, we have gotten a good report from Patrick on Dakota and Kinsley. Uh, CPS down there is not at this time, and they can't give you a definite date when or if they're ever going to rule on her going back with mom and her husband. Okay. So we're there, and my kids pray for my two boys, Dakota and Patrick. They are on their way to Oklahoma on the 18th of September for three months. And I assume that's for work, right? That is for work. They work for GE International and they're on the road more than they're at home sometimes. Okay. And Alicia, they've got her tremor, or her tremor, they've got her uh, grand moles down to about one a day right now. But as the pregnancy goes on, it could go back up. They just don't know. Okay. So, um, Lois is saying that the spot in the longest really hasn't changed, and they're just going to keep track of that over the next couple of years, make sure that's going all right. Sounds like there's a good report from the kids in Arkansas, and just to be in prayer for Dakota and Patrick as they travel to their next place of employment. Winter. Anyway, Winter's last day is Friday this week? For, for Mountain View. For Mountain View. Here will be okay. Anyway, Winter's getting ready to move on, her and, and her husband. And we just uh, want to be praying for you guys as you move to Townsend. And we're really going to miss you a lot. Anyway. Um, Buzz. All that green stuff downstairs is for giveaway, so take what you need. Okay. <laughs> There's vegetables in the uh, coffee grounds, holy grounds. I think it's there. Wow. Must be tired. Anyway, help yourself. <laughs> help, help yourself to the vegetables. What else do we have? Diane. Well, we need prayers for uh, the Blanchard family. Earl Blanchard passed away Monday afternoon. Mary Lee Bocker is. So Diane's just uh, making us uh, aware of uh, that Earl Blanchard has passed away, and uh, sounds like the service will be put off. And then just to be in prayer for her, for his family. Friend, family. Okay. Any, anything, Angie. Um, Angie just uh, just to praise that harvest is pretty well wrapped up, and I think as far as our community this year, the fires were fire season 
I hadn't heard it was horrific, so that's grateful. And then to be in prayer for the Starman family as um, Tyler's grandmother, Norma Shaw, has passed away. Anything else this morning? Yes. Um, I have a praise. Um, my new friend Kelly. Um, I'm so glad that he's able to be here at church with us this morning. Kelly, welcome. We're glad to have you this morning. Thank you. Good to have you. Carrie, I have one thing. Um, I'll tell you so you can hear. So I talked to Dane this weekend, and he's doing very well. Thank you for praying for him. Uh, but he has a friend of his, a really good friend of his, down there at Fort Bragg that has nerve damage between his spine and neck, which I thought the spine was a part of that. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but um, he's a young guy like Dane, and he is most likely going to get discharged, medical discharge from the army because of the damage that has been caused to his nerves and his neck, and he loses feeling in his arms and leg, and it's super painful, and he's really struggling, and he's a good buddy of Dane's. We hear about Austin all the time, and so when he shared that yesterday, I didn't get his last name, I'll get his name for the bulletin, but um, if you could be praying for him, because that is just terrible for anybody, but especially a young man, to be suffering like that. So Austin is his name. Did I see Gamma? Yes. Um, my sister is, is um, struggling with some health issues, and so we pray for her family. What's their name? Donna Falcon Howard. Should we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? Uh, just before we go there, just a couple things I forgot to mention is Tom Schumann, um, who has been attending with us, he's a gentleman that had blockage in an artery in his neck, and um, he was rushed to the ER yesterday. I don't know if Russ has any update on that or not. He uh, got to go home with different medicine again, and they just, you know, and they were hoping to be here today, but Leanne said he's got a lot of dizziness, almost like vertical going on. So just keep him in prayer because it's frustrating, very frustrating for both of them. Okay. And it's, it's hard because it's like that they're waiting for the shoe to drop. Right, okay. Just uh, after the surgery, just kind of been dealing with medic medication that has been messing him up, uh, dizziness and stuff. So keep him in the prayers. And then also, Phyllis Worrell did have the pacemaker uh, put in, and it sounds like the recovery's going well for her. Okay, Donna. I'm prayers for my brother. He's having, he had a cold a couple of years ago, and he's still having trouble getting around. Can you give me a name? and is uh, just having uh, repercussions from COVID. Still <coughs> okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, again, we just come before you this day, Lord, with um, just prayer requests of um, what what is going on in people's lives and just, Lord, knowing that um, you can do a mighty work in us, Father. So the names that were mentioned this morning, Tom Schumann and Phil Swarrow, um, we discussed uh, what's going on in those lives, and this morning uh, we just want to be continue just to be in prayer for Lois as she continues just with health issues. We're grateful that the spots on her lungs have not grown, and, and that the doctors are keeping an eye on that situation. We also want to just re, um, we're grateful for their good report that's taking place in Arkansas with family. Lord, we want to lift Patrick and Dakota as they are on the road again. Uh, uh, going to the next job that they're involved in. We just pray for safety and travel as they continue um, their work. Lord, um, just grateful to have had Dr. Winter with us and that they're here for a little longer, Lord. But my prayer would be that as they travel to Townsend to a new home and um, as Buck continues his service, we just pray, Father, that you would open doors for them as they continue just to serve, Lord. And, we thank you for Buck's service in the military. We just pray, Father, as they go forward, that you would just be with them as they uh, continue their life, Father. Lord, this morning we want to just lift the family of um, Earl Blanchard, who's passed away in his family, Father, just to be with that family in this time of loss. And 
We just pray, Lord, that um, through you, Father, that they would be able to get through this. And um, I know that it's a, a lost uh, father to some boys and just um, to a, a, a gal, Father, that's been part of his life. We just pray for that family as they go forward. Father, just um, we're get grateful again for the harvest that we've had, Father. I know there's uh, farmers still trying to finish up. And we just pray, Father, that the weather would hold and they would get the crops off. Just grateful, Father, for um, the fires to be down as far as on in the harvest this year. We're grateful just for the awesome bounty of the crop, Lord. How you bless this community again with just a huge crop. So we're grateful for that. Father, um, just want to be praying for Danny's friend, um, Austin, that's just dealing with some um, issues a, a young man shouldn't have to go through, Father. But I just pray, Father, that he could find um, relief to the pain that's upon him, Lord, and that um, all things would work out for him in the end. Uh, Lord, I'm also just grateful for this morning for Callie just to be here and be part, part of our service this morning. I just pray, Father, that you would continue to work in his life, Lord, that he could see a mighty work being done in his life. And so we lift that to this morning as well. Um, Father, just want to pray for um, Merle Larson, Lord. I know that he's continuing, continuing to um, just uh, deal with the aftermath of COVID. Father, we just pray that you would continue to just heal him in a way that he would know that you're present. And we just thank you for that. I also want to just lift um, Donna, Emma, the Emma sister, Lord. She's just uh, dealing with with things right now, Lord, her and her family. We just pray that that you would be involved in that situation. And Lord, again this morning, um, I'm just grateful that we can collectively come together here, Lord, be in your house this day. And that, Father, we can just see a mighty work through this worship service today that's taking place here. I do lift Kit's message this morning and pray, Father, that through his message today, that we can just uh, glean from it what you would have us to glean, that we can just see you at work in a mighty way. Father, we're so thankful and grateful that we can just come and, and worship Father. Worship Father and know that um, you have a mighty presence in this body. Lord, in all things, we love you. We pray that in your name this morning.
this time of communion, the Lord instituted what we, we celebrate at what's called the Last Supper, a meal, possibly a really good meal. And, you know, as I think about communion, I think about that kind of stuff. I think about meals. And, you know, I'd be hard-pressed to, to list my favorite meals, right? You, you might have, you're like, man, I already know what mine is, Kit, right? But, but some days, I long to go back to my grandma's table and sit there and eat, eat, enjoy a dinner of, say, sauerkraut, potatoes, sausage, and Monterey Jack cheese. Uh, so good, right? Maybe, maybe when she'd make a, a, an apple dumpling, she'd make apple dumplings and I would, she'd pull them out fresh and they'd be hot out of the oven. It smells so good in her house. Pour a little bit of milk over it and enjoy that with her, you know? Maybe you have one that you, you think of that's so simple, but it's your favorite meal. You know, we, we think about the simple things to be, to be fair about it, right? To, to say, sure, that was my favorite meal. But can you think of a few meals that tasted better than your favorite meal? Maybe it's your grandparents' house, right? On the other side of the spectrum, though, of the menu, right? How many of you have ever dined in an upscale restaurant? I have, very rarely, but I have. And you have these delicious treats that my grandparents never would have tasted, right? Those two were memorable meals. One was a restaurant that revolved around a hotel. But to say the least, there is a considerable contrast between the simple and the exquisite meals, right? You, you would agree with that. I know of only one meal which so vividly has that contrast experience at the same time. It's when we meet at the Lord's table. It's unlike any other dining experience in our lives. 
The Lord's Supper is simple, and yet so deeply profound, is it not? It's, it, is a, it is a personal thing. It's as if I'm participating as the Lord did it. And yet we think about how universal it is across the board with everybody, every Christian around the globe. Think about it. It looks back across the span of time. And yet we all celebrate it. But it also looks forward to a time where we have no more suffering and darkness. It's a picture of tragic death, and yet it's a proclamation of triumphant life. It's not expensive to provide, yet it's costly to purchase. The food is that of a poor man, just a bite of bread and a sip of juice, and yet never has so extravagant a meal ever been served. We, who are many, become one body as Christians, under one banner. And when we, when we take it together, that's what we're doing. We're proclaiming together the Lord's Supper and what he did at the cross. And we focus on his broken body and his shed blood together. We focus on our sin being forgiven. And the Lord assures us in his word that he forgets it. But yet it costs so much. We have to remember how forgiveness is made possible. Jesus says to do this in remembrance of me. To remember what he did. To make us what we are. We who are imperfect take the Lord's Supper to remember the perfect lamb without spot or blemish. We who are sinful take the Lord's Supper to remember a sinless substitute who became our Savior. We who are perishable take the Lord's Supper to remember an imperishable promise from an eternal God. We who were lost take the Lord's Supper to remember the one who found us. You see, we who are in this land that we call earth, we take the Lord's Supper to remember the one who can usher us to where he's at. And, and I, it's funny, as I was preparing this and thinking about it, I was like, you know what? I, I thought about all my favorite meals, but I can tell you that this is, Probably my favorite meal. This is probably the one that I celebrate the most. And the one that we're invited to on a weekly basis to remember the Lord and what he's done. And I would encourage you to look to what Christ has done for us through the cross. And through his body. And through his blood. And through his resurrection. Will you pray with me? Father, as we come into this time to remember you and what you've done for us at the cross. Through your body and through your blood. Through your resurrection, Lord, that we may never forget how simple it is, but yet so costly and exquisite, Lord, what you've done for us should not be forgotten. Lord, I pray that as you tell us to do, that we would do this in remembrance of you, never forgetting what was done for us. Father, what an opportunity we have to sit down with you, to commune with you, to remember the sacrifice made on our behalf. And Father, it's a great thing to know that Christians all around the world are coming together, just as we do, to celebrate this meal. May we never forget. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Could I have a couple people come and help serve communion, please?
very moment, God calls your name. And uh, I hope, my hope through this was that you would hear God regardless of, of how I preach. And we, we've talked about how when God calls your name, what happens? And we've, we've looked at seven different instances in Scripture. And we know that God calls plenty of people by name, right? But only seven times in Scripture did he call it twice. And each time that God calls someone's name twice, he follows it with something profound and something life-changing for them. Remember he called Samuel to demonstrate just how important it is to listen to God's voice. He called Martha to remind her to slow down and spend time at the feet of Jesus. He called Peter to warn him about the snares of Satan and to encourage him to get back up and depend on his faith when he fails or when he falls. The last person we're going to talk about today is a guy named Saul, who eventually became Paul. You might know the story. You see, the story of Paul's encounter with Christ is so compelling, it's so life-changing, that it's actually told three times in the book of Acts. Once when it was happening in Acts chapter 9, then Paul, it affected him so much that he retells it twice in Acts 22 and Acts 26. And I know it's probably familiar to you, but make sure that we remember the setting of how it took place. And it took place in the early days of the church, okay? Remember that Saul was a Pharisee from a very important Jewish family. He once referred to himself as the Hebrew of Hebrews, remember? In Philippians chapter 3. In other words, when it came to his religion, nobody could match him. He was the man. In fact, when Saul was so zealous about Judaism that he couldn't stand to see anyone converting from Judaism to Christianity. It made him his blood boil. And as Christianity began to spread through the Jewish community, he became enraged. And he took it upon himself to make it a, a, a personal goal in his life to bring about the end of Christianity. Okay? He would go in the name of God after these heretics, quotation marks, heretics, right? Because they were threatening his faith, and, and he would either arrest them or kill them. For months, the man born as Saul, he was the greatest threat to early Christians that we know. He was bankrolled by the Jerusalem religious leaders, and he passionately pursued them. He would go after them with an iron fist. He would find them, and he'd flog them, and he'd tear their houses down and burn their houses and, and possibly arrest them and kill them if they did not renounce their faith in Jesus. You see, we're going to see how much God can change a person's life. If you think you've gone too far, you've not gone as far as Paul or Saul. Because we can be stubborn people. Did you know that? We can be a stubborn people and, and, and we can think to ourselves that God can't use me or God doesn't want me because I've done too much. But Saul is a perfect example of no matter how far we've gone away from God, that he still wants us a part of his family. Through Saul... I hope that we will see that God doesn't just give up on us when we resist the urgings of God. But let me pray, and we will dig in. Lord, I just come to you and say thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to teach your word. Speak through me, Lord. Allow me to be used as an instrument to communicate your word. Speak to our hearts and minds in which you tell us this day. In Jesus' precious name, we not pray. Amen. So we're going to start in the, uh, uh, Acts chapter 9. Okay. If you have your Bibles and you want to want to look there and see what's going on, you can, or mark it for later, uh, whatever it is. At the in your bulletins on the the sermon notes, it, it gives you the three chapters that this story is told. Okay, so if you want to go read it later, 
You can. All right? But we're going to start in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and, and see this context in, in real life. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous, that word murderous, threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now remember, right before this, before he decided to go after the church, in Acts chapter 7, Saul is the man who gave the approval to the killing of Stephen. Okay? Stephen stood before the, the synagogue uh, priests and rabbis and preached to them the Lord Jesus Christ, and they took him out in the street and they killed him. They threw rocks at him. But Saul is the man who uh, got coats laid at his feet, and they said, you are the man, Saul. That was a way of them uh, uh, saying that he was the man, okay? The one that was in charge, giving his approval of what happened, okay? And in Acts chapter 9, we see he gets permission to go into the world and go after the disciples. Go after Christians. Go after those that are following Jesus. He received these letters. And, and we know as we, as we read through Acts chapter 9 that he had companions with him, which would have probably been armed guards. Some translations actually read Acts chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 says that he had men as guards with him. Okay. Now he recruited some extra muscle for this mission and he went. And he was ready for anything. They got on their way to a town called Damascus. Along the way, in Acts chapter 9, this is where Saul meets Jesus Christ face to face for the first time. You might think, kid, how did he do that? Jesus was already in heaven. Well, Jesus can do whatever he wants. Okay? So understand that. The Bible tells us that around noon, as Saul and his companions approached the city, a bright Light, lighter, brighter than anything he's ever seen, brighter than the sun, poured on Saul and his companions. Think about it like this. If you've ever performed on stage, on a stage as, a, as an actor, like in a pageant or a high school play or something, and you have this huge spotlight shining down on you, you can't see anything, right? You kind of get the gist. But magnify it by like a million times, okay? And it was so blinding, and in fact, it blinded Saul. Okay, it out outshined the sun, and, and, and he fell to his knees, and he heard someone say his name twice. Let's see how Paul tells it in Acts 26, verse 14. If you have your Bibles, flip over a few chapters to Acts 26 if you want to see how Paul tells it, how it happened to him. In Acts 26, 14, it says... Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Saul says, who are you? And a voice responded, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now Jesus certainly knows how to get someone's attention, does he not? <coughs> one of the things that I find most curious about how, how Saul tells it, or how Paul tells it here in this instance, is that statement he makes. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, you ever read that and go, I don't know what a goat is. Does anybody know what a goat is? We've heard the term, we go with somebody, right? Now, there's a couple of you that raise your hands. If you've ever worked with animals, you might know this. To kick against the goats was a common expression found in both Greek and Latin literature. It's actually a rural image which arose from the practice of farming farmers goading their animals in the fields. It's very unfamiliar to us, but you might have heard it. Goads were typically made of a slender piece of wood, like a, like a dowel rod, okay? It was blunt on one end, and it would often have a pointed piece of iron on the other end, okay? It was like a nail. Think of like a nail embedded into it, okay? Farmer used the pointed end to urge or to goad the stubborn animal typically ox and cattle, into motion and steer them in the right direction. Get that part? To steer them in the right direction. 
Okay? And remember, Jesus asks him, why do you kick against the goats? You see, this beast would often resist or even rebel by kicking against the goat. The more the animal kicked, the more likely the goat would stab in the flesh of its leg, causing the animal greater pain. Are you getting this picture of what Jesus is telling Paul, as he calls him? And this is the image that Christ's words give us. And Saul's conversion would appear to us as having been a sudden encounter with Christ, but I can tell you that it's not, based upon how the Lord expressed himself to him, how he was kicking back. If you think about it, he'd been prodding or goading Saul for years, trying to get him to go in the right direction. Think about it. They probably heard, Saul probably heard Jesus teach and preach in public places. He was a part of the synagogue. He was part of the synagogue council. They were similar in age. They would have been peers in a city that Saul knew well, and Jesus would have frequently visited that city. Imagine Saul as one of those Pharisees standing at the windows trying to hear what the heretic has to say, right? And wondering what he's going to say next so that they can write it down or whatever they did, right? He would think that this man was Satan to go and accuse him and, and, and let's, let's figure out how we can kill him. He might have been one of the, the, the people that was a part of the Pharisees that wanted to kill Jesus. But I can tell you that Jesus' ministry probably stuck in Saul's mind, did it not? Because he began to see the words and the works of Jesus. And it haunted this zealous Pharisee. Because if you think about it, once you seriously encounter Jesus, there's no escaping him, is there? There's that conscience part of our life. And we begin to see what Jesus has done, and it begins to sear in our conscience. It begins to goad us in a direction. But you understand that Saul continued to resist God's prodigy. And I believe God goaded Saul in other ways too. Think about all the Christians that he would have arrested or assaulted. Don't you think some of them might have shared their testimony as they were dragged to jail? Don't you think some of them, as they're dragged away in chains as they must have believed, you don't understand that Jesus is real. He is risen. He changed my life. Men saying, I was blind, but now I see. I was lame for 40 years, but now I can walk. I was deaf, but I hear you now. I was demon-possessed, but now I'm free. I was dead four days, but I'm alive again. Lazarus? Maybe you were one of the people that ate, maybe, maybe it was one of the people that ate the bread when Jesus multiplied the fish and the bread. Maybe you were a person who saw the nail-scarred hands of Jesus as, he had, as it happened. And each time, Saul heard these stories as they fled to him. And this would have been God goading Saul in the right direction. The more he resisted, the worse it hurt. He kept kicking. One of the things about this, though, one of the things I find kind of ironic is Saul prided himself on the fact that he studied under a man named Gamaliel. Okay? He was a highly respected Jewish rabbi. And yet when Gamaliel first heard about this Jesus movement, he warned the high council to not act too quickly. Because there were other movements that had happened under their watch. And he pleaded with them. He said, look, there were these people that came with 400 people and tried to take over, but... They died, and their followers went away. And he says, in, in Acts chapter 5, verse 38 and 39, Gamaliel says, Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail, like it had before. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. That's that term again. Those words, as Saul prided himself on being 
an apprentice of Gamaliel, I'm sure that those words continued to go to him as well. But he kept kicking against the goats. He kept going against what God wanted him to do. He kept going further and further away from God as God continued to try to bring him back in. Do you get the picture that I'm painting here for you? That there is nothing, or no matter how far you can go, that God doesn't want you. You see, Saul's actions are senseless. Just as senseless as an animal kicking against the goats. Saul had a passion. He was going to tear this, place, tear this thing down. He was going to go in the exact opposite direction. You want to talk about stubborn. He was probably the most stubborn man that we have in Scripture. But Jesus, just like in our lives, has come down to us and spoken to us and revealed his true nature to us, just like he did Saul. <laughs> it's going to appear. And all this leads us to a question. How many of us are fighting against God by Saul? How many of us? You see, there's a powerful lesson in the ancient Greek proverb. We, too, only hurt ourselves when we fight against God's will. Solomon writes in Proverbs 15.10, Stern discipline awaits him who leaves the path. When we choose to disobey God, we become like a stubborn animal, driving the goat deeper and deeper. Proverbs 13, 15 tells us the way of the unfaithful leads to their destruction. And when we resist God's authority, we're only punishing ourselves, folks. I know there's been many times in my life where I've strayed and I've went this way and I wanted to go my own way only to, to get beat up or to fall down or miss the, miss the turn or miss the path or whatever it is. And I feel like an idiot when I realize, when I come to my senses and I realize, man, what am I doing? I don't know if you've ever been there. But we've got to understand that we, God has a plan for our lives, just as he did Saul. But oftentimes, how does it end up being? Our plans don't typically line up with God's plans, do they? Because our plans are different. We want to do what we want to do, right? In fact, the Bible talks about that too. Proverbs 16.9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Think about it. When our plans and the Lord's plans don't line up, we tend to resist like a stubborn animal, don't we? Do we not? Thinking we know best, but in reality, we just keep trying to go the wrong way. Often liken it to the prodigal son, if you know the story. If you don't, let me sum it up for you real quick. A young boy comes to his dad and says, I don't want to live here anymore. I want to go on my own way. Give me my money, dad. And he leaves. Gets his money and he leaves. And he finds himself face down in pig slop. And the Bible tells us he comes to his senses and he goes, man, what am I doing? I got a good life back home. I'm going to go home and I'm going to apologize. I'm going to become one of the dad's hired men and I'm just going to do it all over again. But he came to his senses and realized he, he was only hurting himself. And he went back home and dad said, welcome home, son. You're, you're back in the fold, right? It's an amazing story. Luke chapter 15, if you want to read it. But I can tell you that when we begin to start going our own way, God begins to poke and prod us and try to get us back on tra track. And God can do that a lot of different ways, can he not? Sometimes we get a guilty conscience. Sometimes we have a restless spirit. Maybe it's through a sermon you've heard or a song that we've sang. Or you've received wise counsel from a friend. The Bible actually tells us that the words of the wise are like goals. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Ecclesiastes 12. Other ways God might go us in different ways if you think about it in your life. Maybe there's some habit that you, that you have that dishonors the Lord, so God gives you a little, little nudge now and then. Maybe there's a ministry at church that you've thought about for years and it's time for you to step up and say, <coughs> and God's poking you in that direction. Maybe you figured out you've been playing church and your commitment to the Lord is nominal and it needs to deepen. So God is poking you. 
Maybe God is speaking to you about tithing or giving generously to the, to, to the ministry of the overall church. Maybe you have a, a critical or judgmental spirit that needs to change. Maybe your family needs you more right now. Maybe a relationship with a friend, an ex-friend, needs healing. Maybe God's calling you into ministry. Perhaps you're like Saul, though, and you, you continue to resist God's call. And you say, you know what, it's not for me. I've done too much. Can't go there. Jesus would never accept me at his table. I'm just doing my best to handle what I got, Lord. Maybe you think like that. The question I'd have for you, is it really worth it? Rebellion carries a high price tag. When we fight against God's will, we're only hurting ourselves. How much better to heed God's voice, to listen to the sharp feelings of conscience, and to hear the Holy Spirit whisper to us, to tell us to come home. I'd love to tell you that after Saul stopped resisting and, and, and surrendered his life to Jesus, that every, everything became sunshine and rainbows, but it wasn't. Because choosing to follow Jesus made Saul's life difficult. Suddenly he was on the receiving end of all the persecution that he'd set up. He'd helped start. It was challenging. But can I tell you that it was worth it? Paul, when we read, when we read Paul's writing, we know that he had more contentment and peace about his future and what he was going through. We know that he had more joy and more satisfaction in his life than we'd ever seen before. If we make it our goal to seek God's will for our lives, we can have that same peace and hope in our lives too. To that, that surrender that we don't have to have it all together. That surrender that we don't have to know what's going on. That surrender that we have a place secure in heaven. We don't have to keep hurting ourselves, folks. We don't have to keep resisting against God. We can stop kicking against the goats. Remember, as, as this series is wrapping up, there's several things that we learned. Several life-changing things. God called Abraham twice to save his son and remind him that nothing should take the place of God in our lives. He called Jacob twice to assure him that he didn't have to be afraid, that God would be with him wherever he went. He called Moses twice because he saw the suffering of his people in Egypt, and he went Moses, Moses to do something about it. You go. He called Samuel twice to teach him how to listen to God's voice and begin a lifelong conversation. He called Martha twice to tell her not to worry so much, but instead enjoy peace and intimacy with Jesus. He called Simon Peter twice to warn him that he would be tempted and tested. But even if he fell, he could get back up and keep going. And he called Saul twice to make it clear that it's useless to fight against God's will for our life. Maybe like Saul, you've been resisting God's call and God's will for your life. Maybe you've been kicking against the goes and you're tired of struggling. If so, why don't you, I want to invite you to quit fighting today. Surrender it to God. Embrace God's will for your life. No matter what comes your way, our life circumstances should not determine our faith in Christ. Our faith in Christ should determine our life circumstances. Let Jesus be the Lord of your life. Not you the Lord of your life and Jesus comes along for the ride. And I'll tell you that if I can help you figure out how to do that, then please talk to me today. If you go, kid, I don't know where to start, talk to me. I'd love to have a conversation with you. Grab one of our elders and talk to them. Grab the friend that brought you and talk to them. <coughs> And see if they can answer your questions. But it's never worth it to fight against God. It's never worth it to go that way. Let Jesus be the Lord of your life. Let me pray. God, it has come to you. Thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for Saul and his journey to becoming Paul. Lord, I'm thankful that we have an example in Scripture that no matter how far someone can go away from you, 
the farthest away that anybody could go away, Lord, you still invite him back to your table. Lord, I pray that would speak volumes in our hearts and in our minds today. That you want us. No matter what we've done, you want us. But Father, you want us to leave our life of sin. And leave, leave our life of, of, of restlessness and sorrow and sadness. And to join you in the in life eternal of peace and contentment. It doesn't mean that we won't have troubles, Lord. There's plenty of troubles in this world. But you'll be there with us to see us through. Lord, we can never go too far away from you, and I'm thankful for that. Lord, may you speak to our hearts and our minds to this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our music team's going to come forward this morning, and they're going to play a closing song. And if I can help you in any way, I'd love to talk to you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I would love to talk to you about Jesus Christ, knowing him personally and intimately. But we're going to stand and we're going to sing our closing song. I'll be right up here. So if you, if you want to stand and sing, if you want to talk, please come talk to me. Lord, to be together in your house. But we're so thankful for uh, the story of Saul and how you changed his life and how you set his life on a course that would lead him to life eternal. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see that and that we might go out and, and, and if we don't know you, Lord, that you would work on our hearts and our minds. Lord, but if we do know you, Lord, I pray that you would help us not to resist or kick against the goads in our lives. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go love God, love others. Have a great week, everyone. Have a good week. Those numbers.
Yeah.